Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that I read just a moment ago over in Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 through 21. Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 through 21. It sure seems like a long time since we've been in Exodus, but of course, <laughs> that was because it was back on June 11th, Singing to the Lord, Part 11. Then there was Father's Day on June 18th, Father Knows Best, and Proverbs 2. Then the Youth Rally on June 25th with Reverend Keith Coleman, Daniel Purpose in His Heart. That was about obedience in Daniel 1. Last week was Independence Day Sunday, July 2nd. Then are the children free, Matthew 17 and John 8. And so we're back today, Sing Unto the Lord, Part 15, in Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 through 21. I hope that uh, you have at least thought about a few of the things that we've discussed as we have looked through this passage of Scripture. There is so much in it. And we've just been talking about the general principles of music. Haven't even had a chance to do an exposition of the text itself, and I hope we get to that today, though we have to finish up a few more principles uh, that we had not yet covered. Almost got through last time, but didn't quite make it. So last time we looked briefly at the New Testament discussion of music and the controlling principles of music. We saw that there are two places in the New Testament that tell us about a variety of types of music that are appropriate for worship in the church. And Paul breaks down the categories in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And then Colossians. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms. So there is a teaching function to music. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So the point that I was trying to make at that point is it's a rather a stretch to legitimately fit most contemporary Christian music into any of those categories. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and I believe it's impossible to fit what I think of as trash, like the so-called Christian hard rock, Christian punk rock, Christian acid rock, and the rest of the non-Christian music forms that promoters pompously offer with a straight face into legitimate worship forms of quote psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Punk rock is definitely not a psalm, a hymn, or a spiritual song. Now, we talked about the fact that these verses here, Colossians 3 and Ephesians 5, that those verses say that godly music has an emphasis on melody, which should have the dominant position in any music. When we sang a couple of hymns, the one at the beginning, the one right before the message, when we sang those, the dominant element was melody with supporting rhythm and harmony. So we need to ask ourselves, does the music that we listen to, does that music characterize with melody or is the emphasis on the beat, that is the rhythm? or on lush harmonies, but the melody doesn't seem to go anywhere. It's more or less static. Both Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 emphasize singing. That is a very important part of worship, and we're going to talk about that uh, more today because that's a very important thing that some of you all have missed. Is the melodious line in the music that you like adaptable to singing, or is it like rap music or hip-hop that isn't sung where the so-called artist just vomits out the words like a machine gun. Does the music, as it says in these verses, manifest grace in your heart? That is the unmerited favor of God to you as a sinner when it is sung. The heart is the part of you that the scripture connects with your spirit, not with your soul and your body. Rhythm goes with your body. Harmony goes with your soul. But... Grace in the heart goes with your spirit. Those are all key elements of biblically legitimate music. And we talked about the different types of music and how most of it I consider to be strange fire and Baal worship rather than music that glorifies God. Then we moved into a new area of biblical music that is very essential to our study. And I tried to explain some of the important things about Bible poetry. Because Bible poetry is a major element of the Old Testament, and in each case, it is directed to be sung. Biblical poetry is not just to be chanted, 
biblical poetry is designed to be sung. We saw that one third of the Old Testament, at least one third, there may be more than that, but at least one third, up to one half of the Old Testament is written in poetic musical form. Most people don't pay attention to that. Most people don't know it because they don't bother to study it. But folks, God wrote one third of the Bible as prophecy, and everybody is a prophecy freak. Everybody wants to know about what's going to happen in the future. Everybody's always eager to come and hear special prophecy lectures. How many poetry freaks do you know who really want to study Bible poetry and understand what God is saying to us poetically? Between the third and the half of the Old Testament is written in musical poetic form. Because God designed music to be sung with words that bring glory to him and that teach. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There is a didactic nature to the music that glorifies God. It teaches us who he is. It teaches us about him. It teaches us what he has done. And it cements it in our memories with music. That's why some of the great hymns of the faith have stuck around for centuries. And a lot of so-called contemporary Christian music was written five years ago. Nobody even remembers what it said. Biblical poetry and music. Biblical Hebrew poetry upon which the songs and music of the Old Testament are based omits, as we saw, some of the key structural elements of English language poetry. Biblical music and poetry built on a different poetic scaffold. They have unique linguistic elements which are basic to that kind of poetry. Most of us don't know those elements, though I gave them to you. I'll just summarize them for you very, very quickly right now. There's a difference between English poetry because that descends from Greek and Latin. Hebrew poetry descends from what's called Proto-Semitic. English poetry tends to deal with rhyme and meter. There's a, a sound at the end of each line that rhyme with each other. Mary had a little lamb, a little bread, a little jam. Uh, you look at those poems and you see that, yeah, they rhyme. That's, that's sort of standard English poetry. But when you are looking at Hebrew poetry, you have parallel thoughts. Now, we'll see that as we go through Exodus 15, because I'm going to put these lectures on poetry and music after a while, and we're going to exegete the text. But we're going to see the structure that I've been talking about. And it's all the way through that particular song, uh, just like it is in the Song of Deborah and Barak and other places in the Psalms, you see the same kind of poetic parallelisms where it is a parallelism of thoughts, not a rhyming poetry, but a parallelism of thoughts that God has given to us so that he emphasizes in very special ways divine doctrines that he wants us to know by heart. And that's what poetry and music does. It teaches you things so that you will know them by heart. So that you will live them. So that as you are going through your day, these things come to your mind. You know, I woke up this morning, I had some music running through my head. I thought, that's amazing. You know, sometimes in the middle of the night I wake up and there is a hymn going through my head. And I think, wow, I didn't even know that was going on. But I woke up, some noise outside or something woke me up. And here, the thing that's in my head at that moment is music that's glorifying God. Do you ever have that experience? I hope you do. And you know what? When you memorize the great hymns of the faith instead of the modern trash, what you wake up to is great doctrine. Great things that transform your life. Great things that improve your life. Great things that motivate your life. Great things that bring glory to God. Because in heaven, this is what you will be doing. Balanced lines of thought. We talked about synonymous lines. We talked about antithetical lines. We talked about chiasmic lines. He has a number of what he has is. He has an X. A, B, B, A. Where first thing parallels with the last thing says. Second thing parallels with the third thing says. So it forms an X when you look at it in structural form. We find that in Hebrew. We find synthetic lines in which two or three lines are expanding a single thought. We know more about the structure of Hebrew poetry now. It's emblematic structure in which one clause is literal, the second clause is metaphorical. 
climatic structure in which each subsequent clause reveals the truth in an ascending fashion, introverted structure, balanced clauses. We talked about a lot of things, and I hope you took some notes, because I'm not going to go over all those details again for you. But there are a few elements of Hebrew poetry that also occur in English language poetry, but they're relatively rare. There are three different ones. You should know these. There are some acrostic poems. Somebody tell me, where is one of the acrostic poems in the Bible? Biggest one. Psalm 119. Also, Lamentations 1 through 4 is an acrostic poem. The Psalms were designed to be sung. We've done some of that. They're designed to be set to music. They were used in the singing, in the worship, in the temple. The Psalms are poetry. Number two, there are some biblical poems showing an alliteration of consonants, such as Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18 through 26, where in Hebrew, there's an alliteration of consonants. There are some poems, number three, that show assonance, that is a play on vowels. And we just looked at a chapter, Exodus chapter 14, uh, verse 14, where we see that. As in other languages, most Hebrew poems have a theme. The most obvious of those is perhaps the Song of Psalms, or the Song of Solomon, we'll call it, which is a love song reflecting highly satisfying marital love as well as expressing the symbolic portrayal of the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. This in itself shows that symbolic poetic metaphor can be grounded and often, in fact, usually is grounded in a tangible reality, which can be expressed in parallel in poetic form. And we also know that, of course, very well in English poetry. The King James translators wisely sense those issues, though the poetic structures were not fully developed or known at the time they did their work. And as a result, they made the knowing and thus the correct choice not to use contemporary English language poetic form to express biblical Hebrew poetry, which would have been an unfaithful representation of a literal translation of the text. It would have been an unfaithful translation under the standard of what's called formal equivalency. Because Hebrew poetry does not use the same structural form used by English language poetry, and nobody would have understood it, the A.B. translators used the best form available for translation, which was precisely accurate prose. And it is precisely accurate prose. None of your modern translations have the precision that the King James has. The following themes have been identified in biblical music. Work songs, ballads, laments, epic history poems, war songs, benedictions and blessings, curses, taunts, hymns, acrostic poems, and even the musical magical text of Balaam in Numbers 24, verses 3 through 9. Yeah, yeah. The words of Balaam are actually set in musical form. We see the way in which Hebrew poetry can be used and is used to articulate so many themes, and that gives us a further insight into why God chose to use so much musical poetry in Scripture. Why? Listen to this carefully. Because music awakens the senses and the emotions in a way that other forms of communication do not. Music awakens the senses and the emotions in a way that other forms of communication do not. Poetry is a powerful memory device, regardless of the linguistic structure. Poetry is easy to remember. But it's particularly easy to remember when it is set to music. And God set more than one-third of the Bible in poetic form to be sung. Why? Because he wants us to remember his word. If you've ever tried to memorize Bible verses, and I know a lot of you have, you know it's pretty difficult. You have to catch on to how you do this. I've memorized hundreds of Bible verses throughout my life. Many of them I memorized as a little child. I still remember today. Music, when it is set with words, is especially easy to remember. I suspect that most of you could sing at least two or three stanzas of dozens of hymns from memory. Simply because you have sung them so many times, it has ingrained itself in you, and when you hear a particular line of music, suddenly the words come to mind, don't they? Do they? Yes. Yes, yes, they do. 
That's why God wants us to understand biblical music and biblical poetry and how they go together and how we use these in the corporate worship. We looked at a number of different places where the history of Israel is preserved in poetic form. And it was designed to be sung. For example, the narrative of Deborah and Barak in Judges 4 is written in prose, but the song of Deborah in Judges 5, the very next chapter, is Hebrew poetry. It tells the same story, but it's designed to be sung. It records the exact same events. That's exactly what we've been studying here in Exodus 14 and 15. Exodus 14 gives you a narrative of what happened. Exodus 15 sings about what happened. They're written in poetic form meant to be sung. And it's very clear from the text, of course, that it was sung. So summary, one of the major characteristics of Hebrew musical poetry is thought parallelism. There's also thought parallelism in some English language poetry, but the structural framework is different. Most of us, unfortunately, don't recognize it without some serious study. We looked at a contrast, and I'll just go through this very briefly. The basic elements of English language poetry in the 1600s, when the King James Version was written, or translated, usually include the structural forms of three different elements. A rhyming scheme, meter, we've talked about that, word sounds, that's alliteration, or sound play, which it's also called. The goal in English language poetry is oral. That is, it's to be spoken. It has the right dynamics, the pauses, the hand gestures, the body movements. Those are almost completely missing in biblical Hebrew poetry. Very interesting. There are no indicators about those things. There are indicators about what kinds of musical instruments to use, as in the Psalms, where it says upon uh, different types of instruments, and it mentions some of them. The poetic form in both biblical Hebrew and English language poetry has more in common than the formal structures, however. There are three types of common poetic form. One, number one, there's lyric poetry. We talked about that. There's narrative poetry. We've talked about that. There's descriptive poetry. We've talked about that. So why didn't the King James translators use English poetry to translate the Bible? Because remember, there's one third of it. Did they do a bad job? Do we have a bad Bible here? Because they didn't use English forms to translate biblical Hebrew poetry. There's some people that accuse us of that. Well, the answer is because the key elements of English poetry are usually inappropriate for translating biblical Hebrew poetry in a literal sense into English. More specifically, why is English poetry inappropriate for accurately translating biblical Hebrew poetry? It's clear that English language poetry, such as we use in our hymn books, is, yes, absolutely right, totally appropriate, it's needed. The hymns we sing are English language poetry that express biblical truths. So it's not wrong to write poetry about biblical events and doctrines. For example, and I gave you this example last time, from the destruction of Sennacherib by Lord Byron, George Gordon, describing the events in 2 Kings 18 and 19, 2 Chronicles 32, and Isaiah 36 and 37. By the way, when God gives you that many chapters on one particular incident in the Bible, I mean, think about that. Two chapters in 1 Kings, one chapter in 2 Chronicles, and two chapters in Isaiah. And they're all dealing with exactly the same issue. Five full chapters on one event in history. You ought to pay attention to what's in that event. That was the attack of Sennacherib on the city of Jerusalem. When the angel of the Lord went out at night and killed 186,000 Assyrians. Because Rav Shaka had stood there and said, Your God is many good. He can't beat us because we beat all the other gods. God said, and Isaiah spread it out, or Hezekiah spread it out in the temple and said, Look, Lord, this is what they've said. What are you going to do about it? And that night, God killed 186,000 Assyrians. Because God always defends his name. God always defends his name. And so they went back to Assyria. The king of Assyria decided to go worship his God in Israel. And he went into the temple of Israel, and while he was worshiping in front of his God, his own God couldn't protect him. His two sons killed him. Abraham, Melech, and Shereza. God was making a point. Well, that's been set to poetry. And I read you some of it last time. I'll read you just a little bit. The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold. And his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold, and the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea when the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee. There are six more stanzas that go into that poem. I'll not read them all for you. 
But it ends with these words. And the widows of Asher are loud in their wail. And the idols are broke in the temple of Baal. And the might of the Gentiles, unsmote by the sword, have melted like snow in the glance of the Lord. Now, people have powerful poetry. That's not scripture, but it describes for us in English language what God did that night. It resonates. It sticks in your mind. It sticks in your heart. So that's where we ended on June 11th. So let me finish this very important material on biblical music, and then we'll be doing an exegesis of the text. So in my opinion, it is fully appropriate to produce poetry on a biblical subject, just as it is fully appropriate to write music on a biblical subject with biblical texts. Especially great music, and you don't all know this kind of thing, such as Handel's Messiah or Mendelssohn's Oratorio of Elijah or Bach's St. Matthew Passion. And certainly the hymns that we sing in church every week, if theologically accurate and set to Christ-honoring music, are fully appropriate. But it would have been totally inappropriate to try to translate the Hebrew poetic text into English language poetry in the King James Bible. So if that's the case, we have to ask the question, why? So let me illustrate. I personally love English language poetry. You probably picked on, up on that. But I love things such as crossing the bar. And I may cry while I'm sharing this with you. By Alfred Lord Tennyson. That very lovely poem expresses an incredible soul moving desire for heaven. A desire to see our Savior. I've memorized it, I've often quoted it to myself. In fact, very often, since my dear wife Judy fell asleep in the arms of Jesus. We've just passed the third anniversary of her home going, so I'd like to share this poem with you. Forgive me if I break up. Sunset, an evening star, and one clear call for me. And let there be no moaning in the bar horn I put out to sea. But such a tide as moved seems asleep, too full for sound and foam, when that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again. And evening bell. And after that, the dark. And let there be no sadness of farewell when I embark. For though from out our burn of time and space the flood may bear me far, I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. I love that poem. It's beautiful. It expresses incredible truth about death and heaven. But friends, it's only a poem. It's not a translation of scripture. Poetry, like music, and especially when they're combined, is a compact way of stating incredibly deep truth that reaches not only the mind, but also the emotions and the heart with poignant, graceful, and precise language. That is the reason that so many of the great and lasting hymns have such a powerful impact on the hearers. They express biblical truth with language that is both appropriate and powerful, with appropriate musical forms that cement the language inside the soul of the hearer. You know of the great revivals in the 50s and the early 60s, which used such hymns as the hymn of invitation at the end, 
truth set the music. God uses it to reach the heart and the soul, bring conviction of sin, bring repentance and faith. God uses it to encourage us in times of conflict. You think of the great hymns of the faith like a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Music and words that grow for glorified Christ. More than one third of the Bible is written that way, people. Beautiful poetry, but it's not a translation which I've just read to you. But it expresses biblical truth with languages, powerful, appropriate, using the right music, it cements the words inside the soul of the listener. That's why some of the great hymns of the faith have lasted for centuries and why contemporary Christian music is generally rubbish and usually becomes obsolete within a few years of its composition. What's my point? My point is God did not choose to use the elements, the form, or the structure of English language poetry to any great extent in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. That being said, we have to note one thing about that is true both about biblical Hebrew poetry and most poetry in other languages and cultures. Here's some commonalities. Number one, poetry is often difficult because poetic language is frequently indirect. It's veiled in allegory, it's compact, it's terse. It uniquely combines things that we normally never blend or associate together and simultaneously moves our emotions as well as our minds. And musical poetry is even more powerful than poetry that is only spoken. That's why many modern Americans choose not to read or really study and analyze the poetic and musical sections of scripture or poetry or music for the general. It takes work to understand it. Most Americans and sadly most Christians are lazy when it comes to digging into the treasure and the deep, deep mine of God's word. The lazy reader prefers to have everything fed to him like baby food. Sadly, I'm afraid that some in this congregation are, have been like that. See, the lazy reader avoids poetry and structurally sound music, especially biblical poetry and music, because it demands that we exert energy and hard thought into understanding it. The Apostle Paul speaks of some portions of Scripture as milk. He speaks of other portions of Scripture as meat. We find that both in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 and 2, and Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 and 14. It's not just in one place. We find it mentioned twice in the New Testament. A great deal of the musical and poetic parts of the Bible are difficult. They fall into the category of meat rather than milk, particularly the musical and poetic sections of the Old Testament prophets. Because I told you, much of the prophecies of the Old Testament are in poetic form. Now listen, there are at least four reasons, and I've tried to explain these things to you in relation to music and poetry, but there are four reasons why I'm explaining them. Number one, first, most of you only read English. I think that very few of you read Hebrew or Greek, so you need to understand what's going on when you read between one-third and one-half of the Old Testament. Number two, there are striking differences between Hebrew and English poetry that cannot adequately be reconciled. English translators cannot translate biblical Hebrew into Shakespearean poetic form by the formal equivalence method. Formal equivalence produces prose, and that is the best, most accurate, and most faithful translation. Shakespearean English language poetry would not have accomplished that goal in 1611. Number three, the translators were translators. They were not poets. The King James Version was made at the pinnacle of the most exquisite English language poetry ever yet penned. When the greatest English poet to that date, that is Shakespeare, and possibly the greatest English poet ever to live, was still alive. To try to place difficult Hebrew poetry into English language poetry without knowing the rules of Hebrew poetry would have been both arrogant and absurd. The King James translators were incredible scholars, but they were not poets. Certainly without being great poets themselves, the translators would have been scorned in a world familiar with Shakespeare. In that case, the authorized version would have been relegated to a back room also ran shelf of mediocre translations. We're still uncovering and learning the rules of biblical Hebrew poetry and music even today. For example, 
God gave different gifts and different talents to different men. You obviously didn't know that. God gave incredible musical gifts, for example, to Mendelssohn, who was writing exquisite symphonies at age 12. I think all of us are here over age 12. No, one is not. Oh, at age 12, he was writing symphonies. Believe it or not, he wrote 12 strange symphonies between the ages of 12 and 14. God obviously gifted that boy. By the way, his sister also was an incredible musician. If her older brother had not shined her, the, the sister would probably have been up there in the high charts too with the music, musical world. God gave brilliant writing and poetic skills to Shakespeare. He gave brilliant translation skills to the King James translators. But simply put, although different art forms can be knit together with soul-pleasing delight, poetry and music and translation are not the same gift in the natural realm. Just like the apostolic gifts of healings and miracles are not the same gift as the gift of pastor and teacher. Number four, bad poetry. The modern translators, and there are a lot of them, who try to make English poetry translations equivalent to biblical Hebrew poetry need to make a choice. Are they going to be faithful, accurate, and precise translators? Or are they going to be very bad poets, proudly waving their poetic rags in public? Some of the modern translators and musicians have obviously chosen to be very bad poets and very bad musicians. That brings us to the issues raised by having divinely inspired poetry and music in the Bible. Why did God use so much Hebrew music and poetry in the Bible, especially since it's so hard for us to translate it into other languages? There are a good number of reasons why God did that, and I think they're very obvious on the surface. Number one, God expects us to energetically study his word. I hope you write these down. God expects us to energetically study his word. This includes especially for those called to be pastors and teachers studying in the original languages. Using the terse, compact structure and forms of Hebrew poetry is as though God gave us a beautifully wrapped gift, but we must unwrap the gift and follow the instructions for workable assembly. God wants us to be diligent in studying, interacting with, and expounding his word to others. Number two, certain portions of scripture are called milk, that is, they're easy to digest spiritually. Other portions are called meat, that's the more difficult doctrines. English prose, rather than English poetry, is more suited for accomplishing the purpose of precisely communicating difficult doctrine through formal equivalents in the English language, and God wants his doctrine communicated. Number three, poetic structure, which is necessary for musical structure, plus form and other elements communicate truth in a unique way. Just as looking at a diamond from different angles and under different lights brings out its great beauty. God gave us those structures to communicate truth in very special ways. English language poetry cannot adequately reflect that grouping of insights and remain faithful to formal equivalency, but English prose can, and that's why it's also appropriate for us to have great hymns and Christian music that carry sound doctrine. As Paul talked about that, you know, we're to admonish and teach one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Number four, and I think this is very important, God wants us to clearly understand that the Bible Hebrew poetic sections are equal in value to the prophetic sections of Scripture. That's very important. God gave just as much in poetic form as he did in prophecy. He wants us to understand that the poetic sections of Scripture are just as valuable as the prophetic sections. You know, we said a minute ago there are a lot of Bible prophecy freaks, but how many biblical poetry freaks do you know? Therefore, pastors and Bible teachers need to spend a great deal more time learning how to mine the depths of biblical poetry for exposition to English language speaking listeners. Number five, Hebrew poetry to which the ancient Hebrew music was set gives a beautiful insight into the nature and character of God. It gives a beautiful insight into the nature and character of God. We've already studied how, how God is a musical being, in fact, the most musical being in the universe. Zephaniah tells us that God sings over us with joy. God himself sings over us. He's the most musical 
of all beings in the universe. But the fact that so much is written in poetic form shows us that he's a beautiful poetic being as well. The extensive use of Hebrew poetry in the Old Testament reveals that, I think, in an astounding matter. Number six, by divine command, Scripture is to be translated into all the languages of the earth. Mark chapter 15, verse 16, verse 15, and Acts 1, 8. The Great Commission. Obviously, you can't communicate with somebody if you don't have it in their language. Each language, not just English, has a different linguistic structure, although some are similar. Just as there are certain conventions in English that make prose the best form for translating Hebrew poetry, there may be other ways to achieve formal equivalency in other languages. But by divine command, we have to translate this into all the languages of the earth. Number seven. God gave the Hebrew Old Testament, including the poetic sections, to the Jews and through the Jews to the church today. He gave it to ancient Israel in the venue, language, culture, and linguistic form that most perfectly expressed himself to those people. Do you not think that God was involved in developing the Hebrew language? When you go back and you think about creation, and then you get all the way to the time of the flood, and then you have everybody killed, and they have no one his wife, his sons and their wives, and then they go out and populate the earth, and we have the Tower of Babel in chapter 10 of Genesis, and all these different languages are developed. You think that God wasn't involved in those languages? Of course he was. He's the one that confounded the languages. Do you not think that he chose a specific language that would be spoken by Abraham? Isaac, Yahakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their sons. The language that we've spoken by Moses, who wrote the Torah, because he had a specific message that he would communicate with precision, divine precision, word for word, jot and for jot, tittle for tittle. And God wants his word now taken to all the languages that were destructed at the Tower of Babel. So when we study scripture, we have to go back and learn what God said to them rather than trying to force fit his revelation into a shape that pleases carnal American Christians. God gave major portions of the Old Testament in poetic form set to music because poetry is generally a potent tool for memorization and God wanted them and God wants us to memorize his word. Psalm 119 verses 9, 10, and 11. For example, the entire 19th psalm we mentioned a minute ago uses the poetic device of arranging the entire psalm according to the Hebrew alphabet in groups of eight verses that each begin with a subsequent letter of the Hebrew alphabet. That's poetically significant because Psalm 119 is principally about what topic? The Word of God. And God gave us that major psalm in an acrostic form, a poetic form, eight verses each with all, bay, gimma, dal, and so on. This God's of poetry, is he a poetic being as well as a musical being? I think you could say so. Because that enforces his mind to us. Well, I was going to go on today uh, and now do an exposition. That's the end of Sing to the Lord as we look at it um, in terms of musical and poetic principles. Now we want to look at it applying those things and do an exegesis of that chapter, but our time is up for today. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Some of this has perhaps seemed dull or boring to some of us, but perhaps that tells us more about ourselves than it does about you. Because you're the God who inspired Scripture. And this is Scripture. Every word, every letter, every syllable, 
all the pointings, every jot, every tittle. It came from the hand not only of the divine musician, but from the hand of the divine poet, the hand of the divine orator, the hand of the divine writer. It came from your hand, and you want us to know you, the true and living God. Forgive us for our lazy sloth. Forgive us for our half-hearted study, so-called scripture. Forgive us for relegating you to the back shelf and only wanting to hear a couple of verses about a couple of subjects that we happen to like. Teach us thy will, Lord. Teach us thy ways. Take your word and use it in our hearts and cause us to remember it, to memorize it, to meditate upon it. And then, by the word of God and through the power of the Spirit of God, transform our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today.